Hello, and welcome to the fourth talk of the Warwick AI Summit. The Warwick AI Summit is a series of talks and workshops on a wide range of topics that share the common theme of machine intelligence and the conflicts, applications, and implications of the introduction of machine intelligence into our world. The aim of this summit is to draw attention to the pace at which AI is rapidly changing the world in which we live and broach the difficult and exciting questions that are arising all in an attempt to cultivate more discussion and thought among the next generation of researchers and consumers of artificial intelligence. If you're not already involved in Warwick AI, I'd urge you to check out the links in the description down below and take part. We run workshops, classes, and teach practical skills. We offer guidance on starting up your own AI-based projects, and we have a careers team to help you find work in what I consider to be one of the most exciting and future-proof of industries. We also host events with academics and professionals who are using artificial intelligence to revolutionize the way that work is done in their area. We have one of those with us today, but before I introduce him, I want to quickly pass over to uh, our collaborators on this event, Warwick Poker Society and Warwick Chess Society. So Jack, welcome. Hello everyone, and uh, thanks Joe for the intro. Uh, so as you've heard, we're at the Warwick Poker Society and very simply, we host weekly sessions where you can just come and play and learn about poker. Uh, to give you a bit of background about the society itself, we're the largest poker society in the UK. And back when live, live poker events were still running, uh, we actually won the 2016 UK Student Poker Championship, which is fantastic. Uh, obviously, that was back before my time, so I can't claim any credit for it. Um, nowadays, we're obviously a bit more restricted in what we can do, uh, but we still run two online sessions every week. Uh, so our Monday session is at 6 p.m. and we usually run cash tables. Uh, so you can drop in and play with whatever you, you buy in with and hopefully leave with how much, however much you win. Uh, Wednesdays are a bit different, so they start at 3 p.m. and we usually run a tournament. Uh, so you buy in for a fixed amount and uh, the top few players left uh, each receive an increasing share of the prize pool. So if you're interested in coming along to one of our sessions, then check out our Facebook group or we have an SU page uh, and all of the links and details to join our sessions will be on there. Uh, players of all skill levels are, are welcome. So even if you've only played with your flatmates or your family uh, or not at all, uh, I'd strongly encourage uh, you to come along and give it a go, especially if you find some interest in this talk, which I'm sure you will. Uh, with that said, I'm very keen to hear what Paolo has to say. So I'll hand back over to Joe and but, I hope but, you enjoy it. Thank you very much, Jack. We also have Taran here from Warwick Chess Society. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Taryn, I'm president of Warwick Chess Society this year and quite similar to Focus Society where the UK is the largest chess society and have been quite successful over the last few years and even though everything's moved online for the time being we, st we still managed to run a uh, weekly competitive chess uh, against uh, firstly local Coventry clubs but also uh, competing universities. We also run casual chess on a Thursday night with like a video call on the side to get to know people. Uh, usually these are followed by like a social. So we've had a Netflix party last week, for example, and quizzes. Um, and we also like to get involved with the local community. Uh, so uh, every other Monday, we teach local juniors um, from rugby chess club uh, to help them improve their game. And to help our members improve, we also run a beginner's course. So we do welcome players that have never played before. Uh, and so the people in the club can learn from sort of top level players at the same time. Um, and yeah, there's lots to get involved with. So similar to poker, um, we've got a page on the Warwick SU site. And uh, if you check out our Facebook and Instagram pages, there's loads of event updates on there. And yeah, I'd like to hand back over to Joe to introduce Paolo for your talk. Thank you so much, Jack and Taryn. So Paolo Taruni is an associate professor at the University of Warwick with a PhD in cognitive artificial intelligence. Paolo has an interest in artificial intelligence for social good, and in his work he uses game theory to design AI agents and environments that display favorable, desirable behavior. 
Paolo has published 12 journal papers in top journals and has a plethora of awards, including a fellowship from the Tur Alan Turing Institute. In today's talk, Paolo is going to discuss recent progress in AI in playing complex games like chess and poker and show how we can construct strategic AI uh, that play these games with more success than they already do. Without further ado, I want to pass over to Paolo to tell us more. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Joe. I'm uh, flattered by your presentation. I don't think I deserve all this. Yeah. I can leave to at least 10% of these expectations. Uh, I'm going to share my slide and then uh, start my presentation. I guess. Of course. Okay. Uh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Um, so thank you all. It's great that you put together this event. Uh, I hope there will be more of them. Hopefully not always on a Sunday morning, but I'll try my <laughs> best to be as awake as I possibly can. So, um, all right. So I'm going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and the most successful success stories in AI in this period, which is games and the way uh, AI play games. Um, very happy that the poker and uh, chess society Warwick, uh, where we seem to be doing excellently, uh, have given the introduction before because chess and poker are games I will be talking about. Although from a more academic point of view, I hope I will also give you some opportunity to uh, play together. Uh, so in today's talk, uh, I'm going to specifically mention classical game theory, the classical, so the, the theory of mathematical economics, the branch of mathematical economics dealing with interaction, that's game theory, and games that are interesting from a human point of view that possibly uh, are somewhat, have been somewhat overlooked by the discipline in, uh, since uh, the 50s, right? Um, I'll talk about these games that are in theory easy to solve, like chess and poker, but in practice they are not because they are interesting and require uh, calculations where we are not able to assess every position accurately. So we need to make judgment calls many times, also depending on our opponent. I'll talk about how artificial intelligence be looking at them as uh, uh, what the main success stories are of the current AI technology. Then I'll talk about something interesting on what AI can do, given the intuitions we have from these games, right? Um, I want to start with a um, classical book in, uh, in game theory, which is uh, by Ariel Rubinstein, one of my favorite game theorists, a very controversial figure in game theory, uh, and poses interest, always interesting points of view. So this is modeling bounded rationality, so, uh, which is really what I'll be talking about today. It's a 1998 book. And uh, this is Rubinstein. He says, at the beginning of the 20th century, so this is the very start of game theory, Zermelo, a mathematician, uh, proved the proposition which can be interpreted, chess is a trivial game. To see, to see this, we can use the backwards induction technique. So let me explain first with an example what this backwards induction technique is and how uh, we, what, we, what Zermelo would mean with, this, with what Rubinstein is saying, chess is a trivial game. So we have two, play, two players, one and two, or red and blue. Uh, they take turns in moving, so uh, they move sequentially. As you can see, we start with one, then two, then one, then two. Um, so this is called the centipede game, okay? And player one and player two get, get rewards in the end, at the, at the end node. So as you can see, uh, at the end node, two is going to get 30, and uh, if they go right, if they go down 35. That's, it's, it's fairly intuitive, right? So the payoffs correspond to the colors, and we assume players to want as much money as possible. So how do we solve this game? So we look at the end of the game where player two is faced between going right and getting 30 and going down and getting 35. So we, we say that if two is rational, and if they find themselves there, they're going to go down. Okay, so now we go back one step and we look at player one, and player one uh, can go right knowing that two will go down, 
all going down themselves. So player one is faced with the choice between 25 and 30, okay? So then player one will go down, then so will two, knowing that one will go down, knowing that two will go down, okay? And then we walk back, this is the backwards induction, to the choice of player one, then you're thinking, if I go down, I'm gonna get five, but if I go right, I'm gonna get zero, because two will go down, because they think one will go down, because they think two will go down, okay? So one will go down. So this is the classic solution to any tree of perfect information, just like chess. However, there are many, many hidden assumptions in this solution. Um, and there are, I, I uh, put down a few. So this solution concept, backwards induction, assumes that everyone is playing the same game. Basically, uh, one is thinking about two as if two had complete information of the game and they don't miss any moves, right? And one is also thinking that two is thinking the same about one, right? So there is common knowledge of the game structure. Not only that, but they are also assuming that everyone is playing rationally. So everyone will always go for the best choice, right? And that all of this is common knowledge. So everyone is rational, everyone will maximize their expected utility, everyone knows this, everyone knows that everyone knows this. And because of this knowledge of rationality, of common knowledge of rationality, we can walk back from the leaves of the game, from the leaves of the tree, to the root, solving the game quickly. This is backwards induction. Um, and now we go back to Rubinstein and says, however, in games like chess, this calculation, so this type of calculation like backwards induction, re requires going through a huge number of steps, something no human being can accomplish. And by the way, there is no supercomputer that can accomplish this either. Chess is not a solved game, no matter the performance of AI at present. And Rubinstein continues, modeling games with limited foresight remains a great challenge and the framework studied, studied this far falls short of capturing the spirit of limited foresight reasoning. So Rubinstein says, if we use the classical game theory solution, we're going to be saying chess is a tree, just like tic-tac-toe, just like the centipede game I showed, therefore can be solved trivially. But this is not the way it should be solved in practice, because this is not the way humans or supercomputers look at the tree of chess, because it's a huge tree that we cannot calculate. So what is the spirit of limited foresight reasoning? So before I give you all my theoretical understanding of the spirit, I want, to have, I want to have you on the same page, and let's have a look at the game of chess where we understand what, why, even a simple scenario in chess, and I will do similar reasoning for other games, is not easy to solve. Even if it looks simple in, when, when we first look at it, it's going to be complicated. And for that, I'm going to now uh, give you a very simple chess puzzle to solve. So in this chess puzzle, you are the black player, okay? So there is black and white, and you are black, and black is moving down, okay? So uh, when you move your pawns, uh, you, they're gonna go down on the, on the board, on the screen. And this uh, scenario has five pieces on the board, okay? There is a king for each color, and there are two white pawns and one black pawn, okay? So I'm going to give you 30, I know there is a lag of 30 seconds in my, in my talk, so I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to solve the game. I don't, I, please do not write anything in the chat, do not talk to each other, just think as if you are the ones making the move. So you are black and you have to play your best move. After the 30 seconds are gone, I'm going to ask you about what you thought about the position and which move you think is the best move. Um, Hopefully starting with the non-chess players first. So I'm going to start with the poker player first. And then for my poker game, I'm going to ask the chess players first. Um, right. So this is the game. I hope you're ready. It's 30 seconds. It's black to move and win. It's your turn.
All right, so time is up and you have to have made a move by now. So I'm going to ask the president of the Poker Society to uh, tell me what they think about this position. But before they say anything, I'm going to uh, 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 remind you of the options that you have. So the, the, black, uh, the black player can, has three moves now. They can move the pawn down to B2 the king to e7 or the king to g7. There is nothing else that they can do, right? So basically the question I'm going to ask you is without, without I hope you're not using any um, software because otherwise it's not fun for me. Um, if the, you, you would move the pawn to b2, the king to e7 or the king to g7 and why? Oh, it's your turn. So while we're waiting for someone to come up and chat, I'll give my naive interpretation, which would be to make a break for it with uh, pawn b2. And do you get one move, or can you make a subsequent move? So uh, am I talking to the to everyone now? Or... Uh, so yeah, so so this is just to to me, but I'm. Uh... Yeah. Oh no, there's some there's some comments in the chat. So somebody agrees with me and says pawn b2. Someone says that's the best move, and somebody says king to e7. Yeah, and, and, sorry. Somebody says uh, king to e7 would be the best move. Right. Um, okay. Anyone? This is are these all poker players or some chess players? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, poker player. So we got two poker players. <laughs> okay, so. I, I'm glad. Uh, all right. So and. Um, all right, so I have an explanation as well from some of you. So you say pawn to b2. For the, for the make, queen. You make a queen and, and then yeah. uh, I guess you're going to end the win material and all that. And then uh, some said king to e7. Uh, yeah. For what, what, whatever reason they said that. Um, if they gave a reason, I'm happy to hear it. Otherwise, I just tell you what I think. Uh, there was no, there was no uh, reason there. I think they're just certain. They're just sure. That's fine. A, a random move. That's also possible. It's better than losing on time. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm really happy. Every time I uh, present this talk, uh, most of the people uh, choose pawn to b2 because it's the most sensible move, right? So is I'm going to uh, go and queen the pawn and then because of the queen, I can get the pawns. I can get the pawns of the white player and win the game. Basically, this is the reason. So let's do that. Let's move the pawn uh to b2 so after i move to b uh, the pawn to b2 um uh, why does the reply king to f6 all right so as you can see now uh it's black's turn the only move that black can do is your uh queen to b1 and now white has e7 checkmate so basically uh this move uh, was the only losing move in the game. And it's always, it's always the move that uh, people pick because it's the most sensible one to make. Um, right, so let's go back a bit to uh, this. Just to, I will, I will uh, um, for the, for the uh, chess players uh, around. So pawn to b2 loses to king to f6, then b1, then e7 mate. Um, we have, uh, so, the other moves, there is a, a drawing move, which is king to e7. And you are happy to, I'm, I'm happy for you to exchange the lines in the chat for yourselves. Then we can go back to it. So king to e7 is a draw. And the best move, which is a winning move for a black, is king to g7. But usually uh, people don't pick, but it's the move that actually wins the game for black. And the intuitive reason is that because white cannot queen any pawn, they don't have time to go around and support the pawns, and then you have time to queen the pawn yourself and get all the white pawns, right? So we go back to that if you're interested later on, we look at all the variations. You, I'm happy for you to chat and exchange your ideas there. So B2, the most picked move is the losing move, okay? B2, king to f6, there is no choice but queen the pawn is seven mate. So this is, this is really what I'll be talking about. Errors, quote unquote, 
and how we can take advantage of that. And this is going to be a very similar, uh, a very similar line also for poker. It's about errors and how to take advantage of them, uh, or what we think, as by the way. Um, so why is black losing in this trivial game like chess? Well, first of all, chess is not trivial because calculations are complicated. We cannot assess everything and we need to make judgment calls. Just saying pawn to b2 is the most sensible move. I win material, I win the game. You win material, but you don't win the game, right? So black loses for two reasons, I think, here. So partial view of the game, obviously you, cannot, you are not calculating. You miss the lines, basically. You miss king to f6. Because if you had seen king to f6, you wouldn't have played b2, right? Um, and a wrong evaluation, right? Wrong assessment of the positions while you're thinking. So, and this is really the chess-like game. So poker-like games as well, in a way. I'll go back to that. So the chess-like games are like, they have limited foresight and calculation abilities from players' side. So players have a limited view they don't have common knowledge of the game structure. They don't have common knowledge of rationality. They need to stop and think, and their thinking is limited. And we need to exploit their thinking, all right? So, and the assessments of the game are heuristic. So we make judgment calls. And this is, by the way, what AI does as well, except they do it much faster than us. And I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that uh, later on as well. So, when I say errors, I don't mean irrational moves. I mean bad moves, but I, need, I, I mean bad moves in hindsight. So moves that are bad in hindsight are not necessarily irrational at the moment we made them, because in the moment we made them, we thought they were the best moves. That's fine. With hindsight, it's very easy to judge them, but they're not irrational moves. Let's see this, different, this difference later on as well. So what games are we talking about? We're talking about interesting games like chess or like Go, where we cannot possibly calculate everything. So this is just to talk about Go briefly as well. And this is the number of possible positions on a, on a Go board, right? Which is, you know, as a piecewise, it's even simpler than chess, but the number of possibilities is huge. Now, in a, so Go is played normally on a 19 by 19 board. Well, so the board size is 361. And so this three power N that you see is the number of possible states uh, uh, a cell can be in. Can either be occupied by a white pebble or a black pebble or nothing. And this is three power N, where N is the size of the board. So the number of possible configurations is huge. So it's 10 to the power 172. Not all of them are legal. Not all of them are legal positions. Um, it's just a minority of them, 1%. But even then, we're talking about 10 to the power 170 possible go, go positions. Possible go positions that are legal, right? So I never, I never myself counted the atoms in the universe, okay? I didn't do that. But from uh, Googling them, I read that the number of atoms in the universe are 10 to the power roughly 80. So there are more possible Go configurations than atoms in the universe, okay? Right, so this is a striking thing, which is a fact. And that, a similar number is true for chess, by the way. I think it's roughly 10 power 70, uh, the number of possible legal chess positioning. But if you look at the number of possible chess games, the way you reach those positions, you get again a number that is beyond the number of atoms in the universe. I believe it's 10 to the power of 120, okay? So this is a number of possible chess games that can happen from the starting position, right? So these things are not trivial. These are not situations where we can calculate everything. Even in the simplest of the possible end games with five pieces on the board, we have, we're gonna have trouble, in t imagine in time pressure, calculating everything. And time pressure is something that adds even more interest to even the simplest possible games of chess or poker or go, right? Because of time pressure, we need to make judgment calls. So, so this is really the, the type of complexity I'm talking about.
So, and this is what artificial intelligence has done in the past 10 years, especially like st striking impressive achievements in the field. So we want to design interactive decision makers. So decision makers reason strategically with humans or with one another. It's not just one against one. Poker, for example, is a complex game where there are more players than just two. And that makes it very interesting as well. So in uh, this 2016, March, there was this uh, uh, success by the DeepMind team, AlphaGo, uh, defeating the Go World Champion. Lisa Doll 4 to 1. Go, a very, very, very complicated game where, you know, feelings, experience, judgment calls matter. The AI managed to defeat and consistently afterwards, of course, as well, uh, uh, winning to the world Go champion 2016. Now, on the poker side, this is January 2017. Um, there is a, a, a win of $1.7 million. This is a 20 days tournament against four poker stars uh, of Liberatus, this Carnegie Mellon computer, Carnegie Mellon computer. Um, the wins are uh, no limit access Hold'em. $1.7 million win in uh, 20 days of tournament in no limit access Hold'em. What is interesting about Liberatus is that He's gonna use game theory to make the reasoning, and I'm gonna show you what he does very um, briefly, of course. And then another uh, remarkable uh, achievement that is Stockfish is usually is, is considered the, the best open source chess playing uh, software. And uh, Alpha Zero, so uh, again, a deep mind uh, software. Uh, achieves after nine hours of self-training, so without human knowledge at all, 28 to nil to the best open source engine. Um, this is December, 2017, nine hours of self-training. When I say self-training, I mean, we just explore the game without human databases, knowledge, anything, right? So this is quite impressive for games that are so difficult with a, AI that is even AI unable to calculate everything, right? So these are large games, very complex games. This is true for chess and, and of, for poker. How is AI handling them? So there are two ways, two ways that we can, uh, we can tackle large games with. The first is exploration and the second is abstraction. So exploration is done for games like and go abstraction and approximation for games like poker. Exploration means we, instead of attempting to calculate everything, what we do is to simulate uh, games, so analyze a part of the possible tree in a smart way and try to assess the positions using that. So using a smart way of simulating them. I'll talk about that soon. Uh, this is true for AlphaGo and Zero plus some pattern recognition, right? Um, the other game is chess, uh, games like chess, the state space, so the depth of the reasoning is not the problem, it's the state space the problem. And the state space we tackle by abstracting the state space to a smaller one. So we treat similar positions as the same position. So we reduce the big game to a small game and we solve them, right? For example, what Libratus does. So the, uh, briefly, uh, I will first talk about chess, then I will spend more time on poker and then go back to chess. So um, in a general sense, what we do with chess go and the like is to simulate the game rather than solving it completely because we cannot do it. So we want to understand the value of the position using two things. And this is what uh, the DeepMind team has done. Three search. So we sample all the possible continuations until the end game. And then we try and assess what the position is like use this is this is something i will not mention today but we will couple similar positions using pattern recognition so this is neural network so the convolutional neural network convolutional neural networks especially using a database of previous games so we first train ourselves and then we try and recognize the position we are in based on our experience our experiences can come from a human 
human beings and databases of human beings, but also what Alpha Zero has done to train yourself. So play many, many, many games, and then that's your database that you generate first, and then you do pattern recognition on that, right? Um, so I'm very interested about the sampling here because I talked about the tree, how big the tree is. So how do we tackle that? So you see, this is, this is a exploration method that is the best known now, the best used, Monte Carlo Tree Search. What Monte Carlo Tree Search does is to take a part of the tree that we've seen so far, so a couple of moves that we have considered, and then the question is, with this couple of moves I've considered, I'm reaching some positions. How good are these positions? I don't know. How do I know how good these positions are? To know how good these positions are, I need to assess them. And the only way I have to assess them right, is if I don't have a database of experience, I've never seen this position before, is to simulate the game from then on. Right? What I do is to select one of my leaf nodes to expand it and from, to carry out many, many, many simulations from then on and then get the information back to my... How many times did I win from that state on? How many times did I lose? How many times did I draw? And that's the information I have about the state that allows me to decide what move is best. Of course, I have to have many simulations to be reliable, right? So this is Monte Carlo Tree Search, which is the most important research search method to date for tackling these difficult uh, problems. And it's not just about games, it's also about environments that I cannot calculate fully. Basically many, many situations. That's why, by the way, games like chess or poker are interesting because we can apply them in the real world. They are constrained environment that we can tackle quite well. Real world is more difficult, but not, you know, sometimes it's not that more difficult. Okay. So, Poker briefly, uh, and then I'll go back to chess. Uh, so this poker and games like poker that involve chance uh, are games, uh, and more players, by the way, than just one, are games that, that, that have a huge state space. The possibilities that can happen, so the configurations of a certain uh, hand can be many, and especially we don't see everything. Much of information is hidden. So this is a, uh, one of those sensational headlines from uh, Nature News about game theory and poker. Uh, so it appeared in 2015, that says robots are unlikely to be welcome in casinos anytime soon, especially now that the poker playing computer has learned to play a virtually perfect game, including bluffing. Now, is this true? Yes and no. There is a way, there is a sense in which uh, software can play poker very well, um, but there are aspects of poker that are not covered even by the current artificial intelligence. And I'll go back to that. Uh, I'll go to that in a bit. By the way, you should let me know how I'm doing with time and feel free to, I, I'm most likely going to be slightly over time judging uh, from uh, the number of slides, but I can skip something. It's about 10.40 now, so... so I meant to stop. So, uh, so about 10.40 now, so 20 minutes or so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think, um, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm hearing voices, by the way. I don't know if you can hear that as well. It's, the, it's Joe that is telling me how much time I'm left with. So if you hear me talking to myself, I'm talking to Joe. Right, all right. So poker and artificial intelligence. So poker is a very difficult game. Just like chess is a difficult game. Also, because there is chance there is counting probabilities, there is bluffing, there is aggressive play and all that. Still, poker is a game. In the very sense of game theory, it can be described as a game. As a tree that, unlike chess, has imperfect information. So not, the board is not visible, cards are hidden, so we need to be very good at counting uh, probabilities, expectations, and also to take into account the uh, past information and the information we have about the opponents. So rational and irrational strategies are present there since poker is a game. So what is the right way of solving poker if we can ask that question? We can ask that question, we're probably not gonna answer that, but I'll try to answer it in the most accurate way. So this is a very simple uh, 
poker game invented by an economist and game theory, Harold Kuhn, in 1950. So it's called Kuhn Poker. And there are two players, Ann, uh, and Bob, and there is a deck of three cards. There is an ace, a king, and a queen. And the value is that the ace is better than the king, that is better than the queen, okay? Only that, there is a deck of three cards. And these are the rules of the game. So uh, 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 the responsible president of the chess society, uh, please be uh, ready to answer my questions. And then uh, also guys feel free to chat about it. Uh, so there, are, there is Anne, Bob, uh, the plays, and these are the rules of the game. So there is a player to start and players take turns in starting. Let's say Anne starts first. Players are dealt two cards, they don't see the cards, and there is one on the deck, which is not seen, of course. So Anne uh, can do two things. They can pass or they can bet. If Anne passes, okay, Bob can either pass or bet. And if Anne passes and Bob bets, Anne can either pass or bet. Okay, these are the payoffs the payoffs. If Anne passes and then Bob passes, we reveal the cards and the, the player with the higher card wins, plus one, okay? Uh, if Anne passes and Bob bets and Anne passes, then Bob wins. It's like Anne folding on, Bob, on Bob's race, okay? Uh, plus one to Bob. If Anne passes, Bob bets and Anne bets, is Anne checking on Bob's race, uh, plus, two, plus two to the higher card. If Anne bets and Bob passes, then Anne wins, plus one. And if they both bet, is plus two to the higher card. All right? So <clears throat> this is Kuhn's Poker, and this is a, an extensive game of imperfect information because people cannot see the cards. And of course, Texas Hold'em is much more complicated than this, but there are very many similarities with this game. In particular, it's possible to bluff. And I want to now play the game. Uh, so I would like to present three scenarios in which, so since we don't have a synchronous communication, I understand, I'm going to present three situations, then I'm going to ask one of you to answer them, to answer or to tell me what they would do in that uh, situation. So the first situation is you are Bob and you're dealt a queen, okay? So Anne passed, uh, what would you do? I'm gonna give you some time. If you an answer now, you answer now. But uh, this is scenario number one. Um, I guess I'm gonna tell them all, otherwise, it's going to take us ages. There's, uh, there's only a 10 second delay or so on the screen There is now. a 10 second delay, so perfect. Yeah. So anyone who wants to tell me what they would do, or in the chat, and then... Is there anything happening in the chat? I can't see the chat. David says he's going to bet. You're going to bet. David wants to, yeah, he wants to bet. You have a queen. The queen is the lowest. David, the queen is the worst card in the game. Why do you want to bet? Why, David, tell us. But David is thinking. <laughs> David is thinking. David is thinking. But you can continue in the chat. I'm going to go with the scenario two, which is this. You are Anne, and you are dealt a queen, okay? Question is, what would you do now? So before you are Bob, and you have a queen, and Anne passed, okay? And now you are Anne, you're starting with that, and you have a queen. The question is, what do you do in this position, and if it's the same, what that you would do in scenario two, yeah, right? Um, David is probably still thinking about scenario one, <laughs> David but, said, uh, Ari scenario one, he said, my bad. I thought it was the middle ranked card. In this case, I would pass back then. So he's changed his mind. Pass, pass back. Uh, I guess David will also, uh, what would you do? 
pass in scenario two because if you pass in scenario one, I bet I, I believe you will pass also in scenario two, maybe. Scenario three is this that you are an and you are dealt an ace, what would you do? Right? So is there any other answer that have been given in the uh, chat? Yeah, so RE question scenario one, Chris wants to pass because at best you can draw in that situation, he says. Okay. Anyone else? For scenario two, people yeah. seem unsure, but I would I would pass. And for scenario three, if an ace is the best card, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, you would uh, you would bet for sure. Okay. So anyone else has said anything? Adoring of the Kings wants to pass the scenario three. Sorry? He wants to pass on scenario three. Who? Uh, somebody in the chat called Adoring of the Kings. Okay. Why? He hasn't given a reason, uh, oh, so okay. I'll. Uh, let's, We're looking uh, for reasons in this talk. Let's get a let's get a reason there, please. Uh, Any, otherwise, I give you my reasons. Okay. I think anyone. The yeah. naive the naive thing to do in this situation seems obvious, uh, but there there might be reasons against it. Would be to bet since you have such a, a high card. If they pass, you get a plus one. If they bet, you get a plus two. Perfect. I tell you, I tell you, if there is no other conversation in the chat, I tell you what I think it would be a uh, good idea. David uh, said uh, you're going to draw at least one card. You want to try to get Bob to bet, so I'd pass and then try to bluff. Where? In which scenario? Uh, I think this is... Uh... Still scenario one, David? You're still thinking about that. <laughs> Dave, Dave, I don't think David's stuck on scenario one. I think he's talking about uh, talking about three. He wants to bluff so that he gets the plus two to the higher card. Um, okay. Okay. Always or sometimes or I think, I think, okay. I think this point David made, I was just thinking a lot about scenario one, uh, but so he wants to bluff in scenario three, but not in scenario one. I understand, but I think he may probably think he made a good, Made definitely a good point in scenario three. So let's go back to scenario one. I think um, there's there's a lots of lots of agreement that passing and then bl passing in order to bluff is uh, is the best strategy here. All right. Uh, uh, so my point is this: I want to try and make. I don't know if you buy that, but uh, say you are. So let's go back to scenario three, okay? Which is very simple. You are on your start your best card, and then you're. So some people say I have the best card. I bet. And, and otherwise, I want to bluff and I pass, which some people said it's the best strategy. Now, say you are, we are playing many, many times and you employ one of these strategies. So you're on and you have an ace and you, you, always, you always pass when you have an ace because you want to bluff and make me bet, right? Basically, basically, if... I play many, many times with you, and I know you do that. I already, I already know that when I have the queen, okay, when I have the queen, I'm going to pass, okay? Because if you have an ace, you know, I, can, I, I always have a lower card. But I know your strategy, okay? So you're trying to bluff me, I will never... So, you know, you fool me a couple of times, but you all, if you always do that, you're basically telling me which cards you have in your hand, okay? okay? So, if you have an ace, if you have an ace and you always bet, you're basically revealing me that you have an ace many, many times, okay? So, if you always bet when you have an ace and you always pass when you have a queen, if I have a king, I already know your hand because of the action you did, all right? So what I'm trying to say is, yes, you can bluff, but bluffing does not mean always playing the strategy that you think you'll push the opponent to do what you want, but you need to mix your strategy. Sometimes, so because you don't want to, you want to bluff, but you want, don't want to tell me your hand. So sometimes you want to play certain strategies, sometimes other strategies, right? Depending on what you expect to do. Right, so take the scenario where you are on and you are dealt a queen. 
if you always bet when you have a queen, always, then you're gonna lose a lot of money because I know you do that. When I have the ace, I of course always bet, but when I have the king, there is a good chance you have a queen because you always do that, right? Is my point clear? Yeah, I was just wondering what happens in the situation where if you don't want to reveal your, your sort of uh, strategy, you would almost be betting at random. And if you weren't betting at random, there would be a probability distribution over your choices. And then they could analyze that probability distribution and say, hey, 60% of the time in this situation, they do this. And they could still work out unless it was completely down the middle, at which point you're just betting randomly. No, in the sense that it's, a, it's not like when you say random, it doesn't mean 50-50, okay? So this is a point. Yes, if you can work out the probability, you can always best respond to that. But there will be a point, and this is exactly the point of counterfactual regret minimization, which is what I'm going to be talking about. That is, it goes exactly down your middle, but that's not 50-50 necessarily. I want to play your strategy that minimizes your expected utility, and I can work that out with a computer, Okay. So it's not 50-50 pass, 50-50 bet. Depends on the payoffs and depends on what my expected behavior is on you. I can work it out and I'm going to do it now. All right? So uh, there are, okay, there are not many moves that are clearly bad or clearly good, by the way. Obviously, if you have an ace, uh, so someone passes, you, you receive an ace and you, so if someone bets, you receive an ace and you pass, that's done. Right? So you cannot, that's clearly bad, right? Or if someone b bets and you have a queen and you bet, that's done. But other than that, there are no many bad moves, right? All the moves can be good or bad, depending on how we play it. But like, let me try and work this out. I'm gonna use this notion that is regret. So I will not have too much time. I, I want to ex explore this very briefly. But I want to explain what regret is, because if you understand that, you understand what I mean by bluffing, basically, right? According to the modern AI, and then we go back to chess, and then I conclude. I won't be able to go anywhere near covering the material that I wanted to cover, but it's okay. It's a Sunday morning, so we'll relax. Um, so this is a uh, rock, paper, scissors game. Everyone knows that. There is uh, rock, paper, and scissors, and the payoffs of the players are distributed according to the matrix. So I'm, so I say I'm red and you're, you're blue or green, it's green. So I'm red, you're green. I play scissors, you play paper, I get plus one, you get minus one. If I play scissors, you play scissors, we both get zero, right? So what is regret in a game? And in the game of rock, paper, scissors, say I play scissors and you play scissors. We both get zero. I wish I had played rock. I wish I had, I had played rock. Because if you had, if you play scissors and I, I had played rock, I would have won one, you would have won minus one. Okay? So regret, yeah? I wish I had played something else. Regret is the difference between the payoff I could have gotten playing otherwise. Fi Keeping your move as it is, okay? Regret. Now, we want to use this thing called regret to inform our future play in rock, paper, scissors. Why do I care about rock, paper, scissors? For the same reason why, do I, why I care about poker, because they are constrained, constrained environments where I can calculate a lot of things and then I can transfer them to the big picture. Big picture is poker now, and we use a simple game, rock, paper, scissors. So I'm gonna, I want to use regret to inform my future play. Basically, the idea is I want to play the actions more that I wish I had done in the past more. So those actions that hurt me more are the actions, so those actions that by not making them, right, hurt me more are those actions that I want to play now. Yeah? Is that, is that clear? So I'm saying if I have... If I lost a lot of payoff by not playing an action in a game, I try and change my strategy for the future that takes that into account, right? So as you were saying, Joe, if my opponent knows the game, I'll be in trouble, right? If the opponent can, can figure out my algorithm, I'll be in trouble. But I actually want to make an algorithm that won't 
get me in trouble, even if my opponent knew the way I was playing. I want to play strategies that are good, but not exploitable. Okay, and I'm trying to see if this is possible. The answer is yes, it is under some conditions, but it is. I want to minimize regret without, without being predictable. And let's go back to rock, paper, scissors. Now, I want to I want to use this procedure, okay, which I call regret matching. If you understand regret matching, you understand the way poker AI plays. I want to choose actions at random with a distribution of probabilities that is proportional to positive regrets. Now, random doesn't mean 50-50, very important. Random means there is, is not a fixed strategy. So there is a probability distribution and we can, we can optimize them and we optimize them, we optimize those parameters looking at positive regrets. I wanna choose an action at random but with a distribution that is proportional to the positive regrets. So let's see. I'm gonna start this game with paper scissors. Of paper scissors. I'm red. You're blue. Uh, green. Now you're blue. Whatever I say. The other one. Um, we play two games. One is scissors paper. So I won. And the other one is rock rock. So I drew. So we play twice. Okay. Now let's analyze this. Let's put these two together. What is my regret for not pay? So what is your regret? Sorry for not playing a rock in uh, Caesar's paper. You're blue, I play Caesar's, you lost, right? And now with, with rock, you, ha you would have won. So the defense of payoff is two. So your regret for not playing rock when I play Caesar's because you play paper is two. The regret for not playing paper in rock rock is one, okay? Now, what do I do? What do I do in the next hand? I'm going to choose rock with probability two thirds. I'm going to choose paper with probability one third. And I'm going to choose scissors with probability zero. See what I'm doing? I'm taking my past experience and say, what are the actions that hurt me the most? Those I play with, prob with probability that is higher. So the actions, when I say they hurt me the most, hurt me the most not playing them. Okay. So I'm, I'm ba basically, I roll a dice. But this, rise, this dice is not fair, and the probabilities of this dice are dependent on my past. Two thirds rock, one third paper, and scissors zero. All right? Now, suppose that in the next hand, I'm going to play these dice. Two thirds rock, one third, one third paper. And it turns out I throw these dice to see. And suppose my opponent has played paper. Now, what do I do? Now, my regret for this hand for not playing paper, if you do the calculations, is one, two for not playing scissors, and zero for not playing rock, because my opponent has played paper. Now, I'm going to put all these regrets together, and I have two total regrets for rock, two for paper, and two for scissors, which gives me a strategy for the next hand that is one third, one third, one third for the strategy. Now, is this true for every game? No because the payoffs are not the same. In rock, paper, scissors, the perfect, which is, by the way, a Nash equilibrium strategy, is to play fully mixed, one third, one third, one third. This is not true for Kuhn Poker, but the algorithm, the procedure that I'm using is gonna tell me what is the best strategy in this situation. Now, this is called cumulative regrets. And this is amazing, I can do all this reason, it looks very smart, but is it good? is okay, but still not good enough. Because if my opponent knows that I'm using cumulative regrets, I'm gonna, oh, they're gonna always be in a position to best respond to me, right? Because they are using this algorithm. So the next time I'm gonna, you know, I know what they're gonna play and I'm gonna best respond to them. We are close and this is what I'm gonna do. We can do better than this. And the key idea is the same idea of Monte Carlo tree search. We exploit hypothetical game. So we play a lot of the games many, many, many times against ourselves, and then we find the strategy, and then we play the strategy in the real game. So the algorithm is happening before the game, you see that? So uh, all this thinking that we do about the experience and the opponent regret and all that, is happening before the game. At the game, we just play what we found in our simulations, all right? So very briefly, what does this procedure look like? Now, 
for each player, we're going to initialize this regress to zero. We compute for each player this regret matching. So how, how much do I, did I lose? Uh, what are the actions that hurt me the most? Then we put together the strategy profiles at point three. We select, we roll the dice, right? Uh, we select the action profile that we, uh, that we found according to our bias dice. We compute the regrets and then we add them again to the list. And we do it many, many times for a fixed number of iteration. And then the average strategy that we, we get is the, uh, the strategy that we found simulating the game. Now, Hart and Mas so two, two economists in this journal, Econometrica 2000, have shown that this simple procedure converges to what is called correlated equilibrium when there are many, uh, many players. But if there are two players, there are, there's a, it's a two player game converges to a Nash equilibrium, converges to what is thought to be, you know, the best strategy if opponents play rationally. So, you know, assuming that the opponents are good enough, you know, this is the strategy we're going to get to. It's a good enough strategy. It's in fact a Nash equilibrium strategy in the rock paper scissors. So what, what does, how does poker AI use this information, right? We basically have this regret matching procedure happening all the time in the mind of the computer. But first we need to do something else, which is make the game smaller. Because this game is very difficult. Rock, paper, scissors is fine. It's a simple game, very easy to compute. In fact, know the solution. We can do it by hand. Poker, we can. Coon poker, we can by hand, but st still that is very difficult. Now, briefly, I'll tell you what does the poker, what does the poker play AI do, which is, uh, using counterfactual regret minimization. There are four steps right, with this uh, procedure. First of all, we represent the poker game like Coon Poker, Texas Hold'em as an extensive game of imperfect information. So a tree with chance moves. This is a huge game. We need to make it smaller. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Once it's a tree, we use this regret matching procedure. So we play the game many, many times and we try and figure out which action hurts us the most and adjust the probabilities, right? Take into account the chance that the, uh, the probability that we can actually reach some situation, okay? Uh, okay, and of course, there is the fact that in poker, for example, if you reveal a card, you learn about the state you're in. So you need to factor that in as well. But I hope I give you the idea that what we do is to describe the game as a tree and simulate it many times. We're using this regret procedure. Now, the game is big. We need to make it smaller. I give you one picture to explain how this is done. Right, in Texas Hold'em, pre-flop, you're gonna have many hands in your, many possible hands in your, uh, in your, uh, uh, that you can see, right? So you're gonna have many possible hands. Many possible pairs, especially. Some are good, some are bad. So if I had to make a game taking into account all the possible hands I had, all the possible hands that my opponents have, all the possible bets that they can make, it's gonna be a finer game, but still we go back to that problem. We cannot compute everything. So what the AI does is to basically compact these pre-flop hands into, you know, classify them into like, are they, excellent, very good, decent, good, or bad. You know, these colors is a way that you assign a payoff to hands that are similar. So you treat similar hands the same if you don't have information about your, your opponent, right? What, does, what this allows me to do is to make the game small. And if the game is small, I can solve it. At least I can approximate a Nash equilibrium simulating the move before the game, right? I hope I gave you a very simple uh, explanation of high level, at least, of what the AI does. I'm going to go back and uh, I, I won't have much time. I know I'm already running out of time, probably. I'm going to give you a very simple, but let's go back to play chess and then I tell you what I'm going to do with this idea. So when we play, so when we play uh, AI, so po poker using AI, right? So we try and, uh, approximate a perfect opponent. When I do a Nash equilibrium computation like that, I'm going to say, yeah, I assume my opponents are very good. I'm going to simulate them in my mind and play an, an, a strategy that is not exploitable. All right. So the Nash equilibrium strategy. Good. The problem with that thing is that you, 
you cannot be exploited in a sense because your strategy is exactly in the middle, but you are also not exploiting someone else in the sense that you're not playing particularly aggressive poker. You're playing very solid in a sense, according to the statistics. And you, even, even bluffing can be solid, by the way, but you're not playing. Sometimes you want to play bad. <laughs> if, if you know that your opponent is not able to counter that, this happens sometimes, and I think it's something in chess, for example, happens a lot. For example, if your opponent is really in time pressure, in time pressure, and you have a lot of time, you sometimes want to pose a difficult problem because you know something about your opponent that you want to exploit. The fact that they are in time pressure, they are not going to play the best possible strategy because they are difficult to see. Okay. Now, if you know that your opponent is limited, well, I want to do something else. Let's go back to chess. For a second. I'm gonna go over time, Joe. I hope you forgive me. I will skip uh Samati. I wanna play this it's, game. We've go got on. we've got a couple hours till the next talk, so if you no, wanna no, no. if you wanna I go want on. To take a couple of hours. <laughs> That's uh, all I good. Wanna, I wanna play another game with you, right? So this game is this that you so basically it's very similar to the game we played before. There are two differences. First, difference number one is that the king is not on g5. The white king is not on g5 and h4. Second difference is that white is to play now, not black. So you're white and your king is on h5, right? So the question I'm going to ask you, you have, so now you have to make a move, what would you do, right? Um, and you can think about that a sec for a second uh, in the chat. So you're going to be white and you, you, play now and of course you want to win the game um, and there are two differences from the previous game white is to play and the king is in h5 what would you do uh, i don't know if there are already things written in the chat just tell me if there are or if there aren't while people are thinking about this one uh chris had a question he said in other talks we've been hearing about tools such as deep learning and neural with neural nets is regret yes. minimization an alternative tool or is it an algorithm that's used alongside models such as neural nets this is a strategy that's implemented into these systems all right can i first play the game of chess uh, of course i was just giving, I, I, I know answer. we've got some, we've got some answers actually we've got oh, yeah, yeah. uh no, king g5 no, no, I, don't, I don't want to hear any answer right. okay no. What I'm going to tell you first is that no matter how hard you're going to think, or if you put this position in your software, why it is lost, why it's in this position is absolutely doomed. So no matter what they do, black always has a move that can win them the game. Okay. But why it is lost. And the question I'm interested in hearing from you is should he or she resign? And this is now, I'm going to ask you this question. And this is the question I want to ask you. Yeah. Should they, knowing they're lost, to anyone who wants to answer this question? I'll give my, uh, my own answer while we're waiting for the chat, which is that, Potentially, it's possible, depending on the time constraints, to put them in a position where they make a bad decision, where they, they don't have enough time to compute as an optimal strategy. Uh, it looks like a pretty simple layout, so that might not be an option. But if it was slightly more complex, there might be a position where you could sort of stress them to the point where they made a suboptimal move. Okay. Um, anyone else? <laughs> If there is another, otherwise I'll take your, your response. If there is anyone else who wants to say so whether what if, should... Chris wants to not resign and instead force a draw, if it's possible. Uh, David you cannot wants... force a draw. You cannot force a draw. You're lost. So whatever, whatever you do, black as a way, as a way to win the game. I think the, uh, the, the general consensus is it depends on sort of the time constraints. Um, if... Okay, give me a move. Give it, like now you have to move. You want to give me a move, right? So don't give me uh, a speech. Give me a move that you'll make instead of resigning. And why? You general, not you, Joe. You can say if you, say, if you like, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Uh, 
anyone wants to give me a move or you're losing time, that's also possible. Um, There's a uh, silence. I think we've, uh, oh no, we've yeah. got, we've got uh, King G5 because black has to play G7 or they will not win. Very good. Who is this person? Gonna this win the is... best, best answer award. For yeah, David. <laughs> David Maxson David again. is on to win. He was not a poker player, David. He's a better chess player than a poker player, is it? He was not. It's, it's not the uh, not the uh, poker player. But he's a better chess player, David. You you have more talent for chess than for poker. Uh, King to G five. Why? Because we go back to the previous problem. So we, I mean, we can play many moves, obviously, but playing King to G five means putting black in the position they were before. Of course, black has a move to win the game, which is king to g7, but they might not see it because they might want to play b2 because they don't see that king to f6 is coming, b1 queen, e7 checkmate, right? So with that move, moving king to g5, which is the move I would play, is, is there is no justification in terms of if we look at the tree etc is about are we posing the opponent a problem or not so king g5 is in fact if you like technically as good as any other move so he's going to lose the game anyway but he's going to lose the game if the opponent is seeing all the relevant variations so if the opponent is perfect yes but is the opponent perfect if the opponent is limited and they are in time pressure they are not likely to see that move Maybe they are bad, maybe we know them. King to g5 is still losing, but it is an aggressive move and might turn out to be winning, right? So by posing the problem, king to g5, we are forcing black to think that king to g7 or otherwise we can get better. We can get more than just a loss, all right? So this is a, a very simple continuation. I will... so. Basically, this is so I, I've looked at these games where you actually try and exploit your opponent uh, uh, limitations. For example, they don't see a variations. I looked at that and this is I looked at that myself looking at uh, these games in game theory that are trees, but they're trees with the core games. With them. So basically, your opponent is so we're of course we're playing the same game, but only in theory because we're not seeing the same things. We're not thinking about the same moves, which makes us playing different games, even if we are facing the same board. Sometimes I analyze a line, you don't analyze. So actually, you might be unaware of a continuation I've thought about, right? That is difficult to see. And because of that, you're not going to consider it in your calculation. So it's all about, yes, theoretically, I'm losing. But if you don't see a special line, that is actually posing you a problem, a serious problem, right? Then you might end up playing theoretically worse than what you should be, right? So this is games with unawareness. I probably won't have time to talk about that. I've, I've worked on that myself. Basically, you look at the tree with the site restriction and you consider what your opponent, what you think that your opponents might see about the game and you try and best respond accordingly. You remember the centipede game there, there was common knowledge of the game structure. I'm relaxing this assumption. I'm saying there is no common knowledge of the game structure, but I can have beliefs about what you're seeing and what not. And I'll try to best respond accordingly. And by the way, you might have beliefs about me and I might have beliefs about you having beliefs about me and my limited capacity. So putting all this together, we get a very complicated tree that we can actually solve step by step. I don't want to go through all this. If you're interested, we can do, I can do that later. But I'm running out of time. I want to show you something else, um, which is, yeah, this is an application, but, and I want to conclude with this. It's a master's thesis of a student of mine at Imperial College, Cataldo Azzariti, in 2016, that has looked at a game that is theoretically solved, like uh, Connect4, but still, it's, it's, it's not easy to play, even with, uh, you know, with a laptop, you cannot calculate everything. So you're it, it running simulations there using Monte Carlo tree search, uh, using Monte Carlo tree search and the notion of limited foresight. So basically, the, basically you are like that. So you have a population of uh, players, your software, your robots, that can see either one, two, three or four steps ahead. They cannot see more. 
After that, they use Monte Carlo 3 search to assess the position. Now, based on the site, okay, what they can see, they're gonna make certain moves or not. Basically, this is what, what's happening. That as, as, a, uh, as a software yourself, so as a software you make, you want to try and recognize how limited they are because you can then exploit how limited they are. So, for example, you can start saying stuff like, if they saw four steps ahead, they wouldn't have made this move. Because if they saw that, what I saw four steps ahead, they would have, for example, put the, the pawn, whatever it's called in Connect4, uh, here, but rather they moved, they made this other move that looks like a move I would have made if I had seen only one step, step ahead. And by doing this, I infer the type of sight or limitation that my opponent has. So I try to learn the limitation and then best respond to them, right? So using Monte Carlo research, plus this notion of limited foresight, plus this Bayesian update, what was Bayesian update, basically how I'm learning about your limitations. This software can make accurate predictions, in fact, plays better than Monte Carlo research only. So if I, have, basically this means, yes, we can do simulations, we can do all this AI without knowing the game. But if we do have information about the opponent, Right? That can help us make better decisions. Okay? And this is not just information about the past games, it's also information about the style of play, the, for example, the level they are at, etc. So every time we can use information to improve uh, learning and searching and all that, we actually might end up, like in this scenario, learning and exploiting the opponent, even if they are perfect for their site, still exploiting the opponent and actually playing better in the long run, okay? So this is an ongoing research line and there are plenty of open questions to answer. So uh, let me conclude back, we go back to classical game theory. So all this AI research, I started with game theory saying, oh, well, they dismissed an amazing game like chess, they said it's trivial, so actually game theory doesn't really work. But actually what we're doing here is to take the notion of game theory, uh, this idea of equilibrium, like see how Libratus play, for example, using Nash equilibrium. It's just more complicated. It's just the games are just more complicated and we want to make them workable. So we want to make, for example, games small, like in, chat, in, in poker, using abstraction techniques and then solve the small game or simulate the large game without hoping, right? Without hoping to solve the game because we cannot do that, but we can only simulate it and in a smart way, like Monte Carlo research does, plus some logical information if we have it. Still, the AI is behaving according to game theoretical principles. And this is, this, I want to quote Robert Oman. Robert Oman is a Nobel Prize in economics, and he pretty much in, made this, invented this mathematical model of rationality in a game. Um, so if there is a definition of rationality, that's Oman's rationality, basically means maximizing the expected utility. An expected utility is not easy to assess, especially because of that word expected. So all these AI abstractions and simulations and all are to have a good idea of what a position is, this expected utility to refine this notion and make it as precise as possible in the context we are at. So a person's behavior is rational, says Oman, if it is in their best interest, given their best information, given their information. So, okay, remember, a move is not irrational if it's bad, if it's rational, it's, it is irrational if, it, if, we, if we saw a better move and we didn't play it. But if we saw, if that's the move we saw and the best we could do then, that's still rational. We're still maximizing the expected utility. So, and what we do is to take it beyond being a person, we wanna make AI that is rational. So an agent's behavior is now rational if it is in their best interest given their information. This is basically what artificial intelligence does. And I want to conclude and then take all questions that you like with a few points uh, that I think uh, I can draw from uh, this talk. Basically the general classical game theory models, yes, they're nice, but they should not naively be naively applied to specific instances. It doesn't work. Like, yes, chess is a tree. Yes, it can theoretically solve, be solved by backwards induction, but practically it doesn't work. So we need to make more specific models without without abandoning the notion of rationality, right? So again, we don't need general models. Of course, 
Of course we do, but to solve specific instances, we need specific models that actually look at the context we are working with, like poker or chess. And especially computation is important, right? It's not just about making the model, it's to show and that actually works in practice. So the computational complex, you've seen like the go position uh, options that we had, this was huge. Computation is important, we need to mind that because otherwise we lose on time, basically. Um, having said that, yes, classical game theory uh, should not be naively applied, etc. The notion of rationality is still key. So the agents, so the artificial software, should still behave in a way that maximizes the expected utility. And in particular, modeled as a boundedly rational, so limited and all that, and utility or goal-oriented uh, piece of software. And this is my talk, and I want to thank you all for your attention, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Uh, thank, thank you all. Thank you so much, Paolo, for your, for your talk. I will... If you just end your slide sharing, uh, I'll ask you a few oh, yeah. questions from the from the chat as they come through. Before we go into chat questions, I had a couple of my own, uh, which we could start with. So you would okay. use... If you, just, just, just say yeah. Um, so now you can, I guess, see me. Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect. perfect. So you mentioned right, yeah. earlier that a move that's irrational is... Uh, an irrational move is not necessary... Or irrational move... Uh, how do I word this? A move is not irrational if it is bad, right? Yeah, I'm saying rational, irrational and bad does not, is not the same. So if you're, if you're making your move um, to maximize utility, given the current yes. information, yes. and you know that the opponent's using, say, backwards induction, to, which assumes that you're playing maximally, uh, you're playing rationally, it's you're, you're um, assuming they're playing optimally, sorry. Would it be a bad strategy to play suboptimally? in order to sort of break their strategy um, if they're assuming that you're playing optimally or would that not work? So I think this, if we are seeing the same three and we know that playing not the backwards induction strategy means you're going to get lower payoff because it's the perfect thing you do because there is, there is no, so backwards induction means you always play optimal continuations. By not always playing optimal continuations, it just means you're sometimes not playing the move you should play, knowing your opponent is perfect, basically, right? So, but the, the, the interesting part is, if the game is too big to be calculated at all, and you know that your opponent is never gonna see everything, can you try and exploit the limitations of your opponent playing moves that you know uh, have, are problematic to see? So, even if it's bad, sometimes a move that cannot be replied to by the opponent ends up being good, like the, op the, the examples I gave, right? So you want to play, sometimes you end up playing even a losing move, like king to g5, because your opponent might play b2 because they're not going to see king to f6. So the question is this, what happens if I'm limited and I know that my opponent is better than me? This is complicated because when I say better than me, I'm assuming they can see things I cannot see. And this is, there is not much you can do there, right? So you can either counter what you, your info, you, you have to work with your information. Okay? It's not an easy problem and it's very interesting to study. What can you do then? Okay? Because all your information you have is the moves that you've calculated. But say I'm playing the world chess chess, say I'm playing Magnus Carlsen, I'm playing chess with him, right? And I can calculate some moves. I know uh, whatever I'm doing, you know, He's gonna see it. So there is no, there is no even a point that I'm trying. Yo, yeah, bluff. I just play sacrifices. I, I'm, I'm, I all, I'm, I try to play as sound as I can, most likely in that situation. So, but to go back to your question, bad means that in hindsight you realize, you know, you could have done better. But then could still be rational because at that very moment you didn't know anything better, so you made that move. That's a difference. So yeah. you might think that you are deviating from the opponent's sort of pathway down the game tree by, say, sacrificing a queen. But actually, if that was the optimal move or if that would get you around their sort of reasoning, it would be in the um, it would already have sort of been accounted for. So there's no real way of escaping the. Uh, yeah, I mean, the queen sacrifices strategy. can be queen sacrifices can be the best move. 
even optimally. So there's an absolute, we, have, we know many examples in which a queen sacrifice is probably the only way to win a game. So, yeah. yeah. So you, you um, mentioned sort of reasoning about the, the capabilities of the other agent as a kind of higher order reasoning, right? So you're, you're yeah. reasoning about their sort yeah. of their capabilities. Could you go into a little bit more detail on higher order reasoning and sort of how that helps us so, in these situations? Yeah, like, so the question is, what, are, what is the information available to you? When you have, so when, when you have a software like Alpha Zero and say, well, using nine hours of training, they got this result. The training was made on the game itself. So you simulate the game and then you get there and you approximate the best strategy you can get from that training, right? So um, sometimes you have more information about your context, your opponent, your, the game you're playing that allows you to refine the search. Just you put that information there. So yes, it is higher order information, but you can treat it because it's about your opponent, but you can treat it as just environment information, context information that allows you to make better decisions. So if you have a meaningful way of adding some logical information to your search that can accelerate your search, make it better. Right? You don't need to simulate everything. Well, you can never simulate it. You don't need to simulate as much as you do if you already know that your opponent is limited in a certain way. So you can save yourself a lot of computation time, which means you know, concentrating on the good lines rather than everything. Yes. So you mentioned there AlphaGo and, and AlphaGo Zero. Uh, as far as I'm aware, AlphaGo Zero used a date. AlphaGo, the original one, used a database of uh, previous games, and yeah. AlphaGo Zero was able to uh, play without any prior knowledge of the game and, and teach itself. What was the sort of architectural differences between those two systems? Why was one able to? Why did one have to rely on this database well, to move, and one because, didn't? Yeah. So because because okay. So basically, very briefly, it depends on the advances on the. Uh, neural networks that you are using and the, fa and the computational power as well. So the thing is that w w one thing is, is, for example, you have human databases already there stored and you try and infer using pattern recognition the similarity between positions. And the other is you have enough computational power and a better you know, underlying network structure that allows you to actually make the dat database yourself. Okay, so basically, the simulating the games allows you to uh, store a lot of games information that you can use as a database. Okay. So, uh, in the second one, so AlphaGo Zero, yeah. I read yeah. that at certain points in the game, it was looking ahead on sp specific lines of play around 60 or 70 moves into the future, which you know is a, is a massive, there's a massive amount of permutations if you're going 70 moves into the future. Yeah. What kind of strategies was, do you know what kind of strategies it was using to, to choose those game paths with which oh, okay. they could go down yeah. 70 moves? Okay, so this is really context dependent. So if you, if you have a game of chess that, for example, I believe if there are five pieces on the board, uh, whatever these pieces are, uh, as far as I know, this is uh, correct. It can be a bit more because you advanced on the, on the computer power. These are fully solved. Okay, so end games can take 100 moves to solve, but computers have already solved. So when you get, when you get against a computer that has a database out there uh, of, uh, if you get to an end game with five pieces, the game is going to be perfectly played by the opponent because we already know, we already know the computational power. So depending on, this is really about the complexity of the game, the branching factors and the pieces they are in. If the situation, so, so I mean, I, I will have to look really at the technology used in the specific situations, but basically the, the short answer is if you know that the game is end game mode, right? So you can go, you can go far ahead and, and using, you know, the information you had, because we know that these games, you can, basically you can go back to games that are already solved. But if you are at the beginning of the game, all we use is theory of the game and experience and the databases. So going, so unless you are forcing variations, forcing lines, going 70 steps ahead in the beginning is not very useful, but towards the end is very useful. Sure. So uh, you mentioned... Yeah, just, just, just to... Not, not, it, I mean, I know that I really like talking to you, but perhaps there are also other people that want to ask questions. I'm very happy to take all the questions. There is, uh, unfortunately, there are... So just... I got a question. 
Uh, I some... got a question. I got a question before. I can answer that, and then sure. I take another question. Just yeah. to yeah. So there was a question about deep learning and counterfactual regret minimization. So I think I think they. So basically, they are saying. I think looking at technology alpha zero and, and the fact that or neural network usage and what is this counterfactual regret minimization at all. So I, so there is. So notice that we are talking about two different games. One is a game of perfect information, simultaneous perfect information, sorry, uh, asynchronous perfect information uh, game, like chess and go with two players that take turns, right? So this is a game that can be solved well using that technology, uh, deep learning, uh, Monte Carlo research and all that. But for games of imperfect information, where the problem is not the depth of reasoning, but the state space, uh, game theoretic methods like counterfactual regret minimization are, have been uh, shown to be very, very effective. Something you cannot do, for example, in chess or poker. So it really is, again, game dependent. I know that there are papers like, uh, for example, in the DeepMind team, where you show that the experience in a game, basically, you can learn two games to play two games simultaneously uh, well, um, actually many games, but they are all very similar games, right? So poker, for example, is a specific game where you have chance, you have many players, right? And it's not the same. So basically chess and go are more similar than chess and poker and go and poker. Right? So depending on Sure. You actually have, uh, there's, there is another question. Uh, Oliver was wondering, does regret minimization eventually lead to Nash equilibria in the two player zero sum games like those mentioned today? And in general, how do you know a player is approaching a Nash equilibria, equilibrium in a general game? Okay, so the first, the first question is yes. And this is actually in a slight, uh, in a slight different variant is proved is a result of 1951 by Robinson showing that if you use this type of best response procedure to the opponent uh, mixed strategy, in two players, zero sum game, you get to Nash equilibrium. Okay. Uh, in fact, you get if you have you know more players, uh, you get to something that is called correlated equilibrium, which is very similar, by the way. So it's a still an equilibrium solution concept that takes into account the way takes some signaling into account. I don't want to go too deep into that. But Robinson fifty one is the result you're looking at uh, here and. How do you know that a player is reaching Nash equilibrium? Well, first of all, you need to know Nash equilibrium yourself first. So if you know Nash equilibrium yourself, you can try and simulate your opponent and say, well, you know, this move is looking, uh, so he's reaching Nash equilibrium. I want to make two points. First of all, you would have to know the game first to do that. Uh, so you do it on a meta level. But if you are simulating your opponent, remember that you are assuming, so you're assuming that so if you assume that the players play, for example, regret matching strategies and you simulate the players, then you know what the procedure is going to be. But in a real game, remember the simulation happens before the game with regret matching. In a real game, you can only observe the actions that are played by your opponent. The simulation you've done before. Yeah. Sure. This, the, the regret matching strategy and sort of cumulative regret yeah. or tracking cumulative regret, there are obviously applications for that in poker. Um, yes. Are there any sort of wider applications that you can see this, yeah. that strategy being applied to in, in, in sort of different spheres? So, this is the, so chess and poker are games that are very interesting and are constrained environments. But, you know, the, the goal is to really apply it. Uh, all these techniques to problems that are important, uh, not, not the chess and poker are not important, but like problems that have, for example, life-threatening situations or situations in which, for example, you need to explore an uncharted territory. And all you, all you have is basically unaware about, unaware, unawareness about the environment. And then you want to figure out what the best move is. You know, if you have a robot exploring an unknown environment, it can be a planet something where that requires trial and error okay so this is this is of course more than one agent uh, situation but for example in situations like uh, where you have many actors that want to maximize their expected utility uh, 
right? So in betting situations, trading, finance situations, negotiation, you want to basically, when you don't know the state space, the, the state space is too big to approximate. You need to ask yourself, is this a game where chance has a role or is this, this more a, a situation where the depth of reasoning matters? So, and then you start thinking of applying the techniques and make a prediction. Perfect. You had a, uh, a question from David who says, thank you very much for the talk. I was wondering how I continue to learn more about AI as a math student and are there any modules you would recommend taking to go into your field? Oh yeah, my, my own, for example. <laughs> that, no. CS404. 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 I don't know if you can do it uh, at the moment, but well, so to learn about AI, you definitely want to, I think as a student, you want to take the modules that have to do with statistics, for example, uh, uh, algorithmic aspects of decision making and AI itself. You know, there are uh, models that are called AI or uh, agent based systems, for example. Uh, but all those models that have the mathematics that is needed for uh, constructing, you know, one or many agents, for, for example, uh, game theoretic methods, statistical methods, and all that. Um, and then, of course, to look at, you know, the trajectory is always, what well, what do I do for my final project? You know, how do I want to, you know, you want to think long term in your university uh, career path, and you want to think now about your the projects you're going to, for example, take on later on. Um, and this is, uh, this is my answer, really. Great answer. On that note, I think we'll draw a draw a close to the uh to the discussion i want to say thank yeah. you very much paolo for thank coming to talk to us and thank you very much for everybody that's come to uh come to listen we had a pretty big audience retention people really interested in what you had to say which is really nice oh, to thank see. you before we uh before we go i want to mention a couple of things firstly i think uh david maxson you've won uh paolo's choice for best uh best answer so we'll be getting in touch with you to give you some free stuff <laughs> Um, secondly, I want to mention the talk that's happening at one o'clock, which is on AI, cryptocurrency and algorithmic trading. That's happening at one o'clock. The links are on the Facebook, Instagram, Discord, wherever you want to go. All of those links are down in the description. So be sure to go and check them out. And that's everything, I think, from us. So thank you very much. And uh, see you at one o'clock. Bye. So that's.